we are talking we are talking about internet of things cyber physical systems industrie 4.0 machine to machine communication interface so i think after tomorrow uh, after yesterday you have an idea about these terms so let me summarize what is uh, perhaps um, the term which is also internationally related is cyber physical systems um, what is a cyber physical system it's not really that new it's a system a combination of connected computers with physical systems like sensors actors things to move things to measure which are connected to a computer and these computers are linked with each other uh, this is a the definition a cyber physical system so not really that new but as the internet was that successful some researchers some politicians believe that the future will be in these systems when the real world will be connected to the virtual world to the internet so it's an idea we will see within the next 10 20 years whether this will be reality or it's just a publicity gag we will see but i think it's important to know about these terms about these topics because <coughs> the society discusses a lot about so um the overall the general term for our content is cyber physical systems and one important <coughs> requirement for cyber physical systems is the communication so we talked a lot about communication machine to machine uh, communication and and some state of the arts we discussed um, an older one which was the barcode and I tried to explain how it works uh, because I think it's quite easy to understand um, and that even the barcode has is quite complex how it works um, for uh, other systems like we talked about RFID I brought some examples with the communication is much more complex and today I will show you just a, a, a brief overview how it works so I, I have some examples with me this is an passive RFID tag you know we talked about that we have active one and passive one more interesting for sure for the idea of industry 4.0 that means that each object becomes intelligent each object object each product becomes the ability to communicate the passive one for sure is much more interesting because we do not any energy supply we don't do not need any battery um, today we will explain how it works but this is a passive one it gains the energy out of the environment either by light or this one by electric waves uh, you have to look through then you will see a very small chip and you will see a large antenna which harvests the energy the electrical power out of the environment I have some here and this one also a product you have to see against the light then you see the large antenna 
and probably you won't see the control unit because it's very, very small. It's a small black point. The most important thing is the antenna, which we need for the communication, but the main thing is for harvesting the energy out of the uh, space, out of the electromagnetic wave. Um, we talked about frequencies, about the ranges, ranges some centimeters for the communication, whereas on the other hand, active tags for radio communication, uh, they need a power supply, electrical power supply, um, therefore the range is much more larger. This one has a range in between 10, 1 and 10 kilometers. So, yeah. Okay, uh, we're talking about RFID. I think the more interesting one is uh, the passive one. I show you some application of RFID in uh, the context of Industry 4.0. We try to make our products intelligent. We want products that are able to uh, communicate. The problem with the barcode is mm, the low uh, data capacity and also the risk of damage. Here is here an application of an RFID tag uh, in the ultra high frequency range that means several hundred uh, megahertz. Um, which, uh, where the risk of damage is quite reduced. Um, the advantage is that you don't have to be in a line of sight with the reader. Whereas for the barcode, for sure, you have to be in line of sight with the reader in case of the RFID, you are not. So the main objective one of the main objectives of RFID is identification. Also, the first application of RFID, primarily they come from, they're also not that new, it was in the, invented in the Second World War, to distinguish between friend and foe. Also today we have intelligent explosive mines, which are able to distinguish between friend and foe on the basis of RFID. So if I'm a, a friend, it will not explode because uh, it, it, it identifies me as a friend. And if I'm a foe, probably it will explode. Um, so this is an application in the context of Industry 4.0. Um, but there are different other applications. Um, probably this is in the field of Internet of Things. In logistics, what is the question here? In case of the train arriving at the station, uh, the question which door may be opened? You know, sometimes the trains are longer than the platform then for sure the doors at the rear of the train must not be opened. And for this, usually sensors are used. Um, the problem of optical sensors is the possibility or the risk that they fail due to dust and water and things like that. And RFID tags are very robust. So water, dust, leaves, dirt, uh, things like that are no problem for RFID. Um, the task is a little bit different in comparison to this application of Industry 4.0 production process. In this case, the RFID chip tries to identify the product, tries to tell the machine about the history of the product, also calling some parameters of the product, whereas in uh, the application of logistics, 
uh, often only the position is interesting. So it's, it works like a kind of distance sensor. If the tag is in the right position, the doors can be opened. If not, the doors, doors will be closed. Um, in this case, we reach a precision of positioning in about 50 centimeters, and that's more or less the range of the tag. So the tag gives the information whether he is here or not, and this is the reason for open the door or not. A robust system for distance measurement. Um, another application in logistics, and so you, these are uh, examples for the different ranges and also for the different data speed. You remember last time I show you. Uh, a list of, of different RFID tags and connected with these different features are also different um, applications. So for sure the price is one important thing. For industry 4.0 the price should be low because there are a number, a lot of number of, of different products and we have to apply a tag on each um, product so the price is a very important thing. You can imagine for the door system of the train, the price is not that important. But very important is the data speed and also the range. For the door opener, for the system of measurement of the distance of the train between the train and the platform, the range should not that big. It should be a small range because this is the identification whether um, the tag is here or not. In other case, if we consider this application in logistics, the train is passing with a high speed, the station, and we should measure which container is on the train. Where is it? Uh, and that, for this, we need, for sure, um, a transponder with a certain range it should not be too too small and within this passing we should uh, also collect all the data out of this so in this case uh, the data speed uh, plays an important role and I will show you also other um, examples where the data speed and in connection with, with the range is very important so, let us check. In this case, we have a transponder with a range of 15 meter. The train is passing with 120 kilometers per hour. This means about, I don't know, uh, 35 meters per second. So, that means the tag is within the range of transmission for less than half a second and within so if the range is 15 meters so this means the time of sending data is less than 0 0.5 seconds and within this 0 0.5 seconds we should uh, transmit, submit all the data. So data speed is a question, range is a question. A uh, question here is, did the container pass a certain position? It's a kind of tracking. Where is my container? We are connected to the internet and then we can see uh, in which place of the world actually um, I can find my container. Also, the container has some information. Perhaps he has is equipped with some sensors, so can uh, decide whether some maintenance is required. Probably in future time, if maintenance is required, the train will be, or the container, or the car will automatically 
uh, go to the <coughs> maintenance service. Yes, and for sure, in general, identification of the container and the cost. These are possible applications for RFID. Also, very important thing, um, future applications are condition monitoring. In some areas, actually realized, especially in aviation. So, a helicopter is very strictly monitored, and mm, certain parameters of the gear mm, and the transmission are recorded and then controlled. And the lifetime of, of the powertrain is permanently um, calculated on basis of uh, this data. But also for other products, I will show you uh, some interesting examples. The idea is we have intelligent products, we have an intelligent machine, which is equipped with some sensors, and for this we can measure some parameters. Typical parameters are the temperature, the pressure, or the acceleration of a system. Let me show you some examples. The most important one probably is condition monitoring of ball bearings. Since about 20 years, it's widely used in application. I will show you how it works. And now it's time to make it more intelligent, to connect it with the internet, with cyber physical systems, and also use the advantages of the RFID, as already explained, with its passive tags. In particular, for rotating applications, uh, the energy supply is a very difficult problem. In this case, we don't have this problem because we want to monitor the acceleration of this ball bearing. Clear ball bearing? This one. How does it work? We have an inner ring. We have an outer ring. And we have some balls in between. <coughs> and we're interested, you know, this a ball bearing has a certain service time, so after a certain time of revolution, it will fail and it has to be changed. So it's very interesting, when do we have to change the ball bearing? Normally you change it at a certain interval of time, for example, for a power station, each three years, you have to change the ball bearings. So it would be much more uh, better if you know the condition of the ball bearing. And so since about 20 years, we try to measure 
the acceleration in the near of a bearing on a certain position of the machine. You can do it with an accelerometer or with a microphone, something like this. And it measures the vibration, hopefully, coming from the bearing. And due to this vibration, we can distinguish whether this ball bearing is good or not. How does it work? Usually, the ball bearing has a certain eigenfrequency. We measure the acceleration versus the time and a good ball bearing let me say sounds like this. It has a particular eigenfrequency that comes from the stiffness and the mass distribution of the bearing. So when we have a defect after several revolutions, for example, a defect occurs. <clears throat> Here we have a defect in the surface of the outer ring. And when the ball passes, this magnitude of the sound becomes stronger. So it's probably like this and then fade out and becoming normal. When the next ball passing this defect again, the magnitude becomes much more stronger than a fade out <coughs> and something like this. Usually, it's difficult to see these defects in the time domain. That means magnitude versus time. Usually, it's difficult to see because a complex machine produces a lot of noise. Not only the eigenfrequency of the, of the ball bearing, we have a lot of eigenfrequencies. We have a lot of ball bearings. We have gears, things like that. So... <coughs> this is very <coughs> it allows picture I lost picture. Usually <coughs> you try to interpret this in the frequency domain. So you calculate the spectrum and then you see the eigenfrequency. We have a lot of eigenfrequency, and if we have a defect, we see nearly beside the eigenfrequency. The signal. <coughs> and it's easier to detect a defect in this. analysis than in the time domain. So this is <coughs> a brief overview how condition monitoring actually uh, works, the principle of condition monitoring. <coughs> Usually, or up to now, mainly um, on the signal of acceleration on, on sound. But newer approaches also use other <coughs> parameters like the temperature, the temperature history of the machine. So we can also measure the temperature. You can imagine if the bearing is worn out, resistance becomes higher and also the temperature could be higher. <coughs> and also the condition of the oil, the content 
of the oil and analysis of the oil. And all these parameters, the oil quality, and all these parameters together are used to assess the condition of the machinery of the bearing. And within an intelligent system, <coughs> we can store the history. And on basis on these starters, we can distinguish between a good and a faulty bearing. Probably we automatically can order the maintenance service based on these data. So this is the idea, future ideas about condition monitoring. Um, as already mentioned, in some areas we already use it, especially in aviation helicopters. Uh, they use these systems and <coughs> about um, the costs actually are quite high and you need a lot of experience to interpret these data. This is not that easy. So experience show if you have one single machine <coughs> and you do the same measurements under slightly different conditions the result is, is very different, it's, it's very difficult. So these pictures are quite <coughs> idealization of the real. So we need a, a lot of experience to do this. Another um, application, condition monitoring by RFID. In this case, the energy supply is, is not a problem because the sensors do not move. But imagine application condition monitoring on a wind turbine. Uh, a very interesting question is the temperature and the speed outside of the blades. How can we measure the temperature at the end of these blades? A possible approach for future application is to use RFID passive tags, when they pass, they send all the information about the condition outside of the plate. What do we need? We need a certain range and we do need a, a high data speed because the speed of these plates are, are quite high and so they pass our range very quickly. But the advantage is that we do not any energy supply, which is difficult outside of the plate. There are high accelerations, there are bad conditions, bad environmental conditions, high speed, high accelerations, low temperatures, humidity, everything that. So if we can apply a passive tag like you have it, which is very robust, uh, this would be a good solu so, uh, solution. Uh, actually, the problem is solved for, for trains, which is more or less uh, the same application as I, I showed you passing speedy trains, but for sure in this application the speed is more than 10 times higher and so this application is more advanced, but could be a very interesting application. So uh, condition monitoring probably is one of the most interesting Parts for the near future where we can use these cyber physical things. Up to now, it's applied for in, in some particular fields, like in logistics, like in aviation, but a general application, also in low cost applications, would be very interesting and could have a good uh, future. <coughs> so, uh, again, the basis, how does it work? RFID, you have some tags, where is it? Where are these tags? I can find them, you know. Um, so, uh, the most important thing is obviously the antenna. Most important thing, it's, you see it, um, it's the, the, the biggest thing, and here in the middle, 
the MCU, the microcontrol unit, is quite small. The task of the antenna is to harvest, to gain, to mine the energy out of the field. Now we are talking of passive tags, not like this, because there are energy supplied. But the interesting application is uh, probably the passive tag. So a uh, very important thing is the big antenna, and you, you see it uh, also in the examples. Uh, very important thing uh, to to task the antenna. Um, how does it work in general? We have an RFID reader and we have the transponder. This one we apply to the object, to the thing, in terms of Internet of Things, is the transponder and on the other side, which is connected to the computer, for this, this is a cyber physical system, physical system which is connected to a computer network. So the RFID reader has the task to send energy to the transponder, to send a clock, that means a time base to the transponder, because the transponder has no relation to the time. And then they can realize a data transfer not only in the direction of the transponder, but in both directions. I will explain how this uh, works. So, the reader, not the transponder, not this one, the other side, the reader uh, consists of a high-frequency module uh, that is able to transmit and to receive the data. So it is able to transmit and to, um, to send an electromagnetic field and um, has a control unit and, and also an antenna, whereas uh, the transponder on this side, in this example, is passive, has no energy supply, and has to gain, has to win the energy out of the field of the reader. So it only works in the near field of the reader. Outside, it's completely passive. This tag does not send any information out, unless it's not in the near of the reader. And when it comes into the electromagnetic field of the reader, it becomes active and is able to send data. How does this work? Okay, the components of the reader and the components of the transponder. Um, we have a resonant circuit of the transponder and the resonant circuit of the reader. The reader sends an electromagnetic field by its resonant circuit so it produces an electromagnetic field with a certain frequency. If this resonance circuit consisting of a capacitor and a coil, this is a parallel resonance circuit consisting of a capacitor and a coil. And if the frequency of this circuit has the same as the magnetic field of the reader, what happens? The resistance of this circuit becomes very low and the transponder draws energy out of the field. So due that there is some energy missing, you can measure this miss missing energy also in the reader. So it's a passive system. You draw energy out of the field, and this energy can, this missing energy can be measured by the reader. So this is the principle. And by switching on and off this parallel uh, circuit, you can transmit 
data. Data in an electronic form is zero and, and one. So it, we live in a digital world. We transmit digital data, and <coughs> the reader sees whether the transponder is on or off. So two tasks to transmit energy to the transponder, then the transponder is supplied by energy, the chip becomes active, the chip starts to control this, um, this electronic circuit, this parallel resonance circuit, and switch it is off and on. And for this, the reader sees whether this is on or off, because when it's on, it draws energy out of the field. And for this, data can be transmitted from the transponder to the reader. In the other direction, it's quite easier, because for sure, also the reader can switch on and switch off its magnetic field, uh, which can be seen by the transponder. So in both directions, data uh, traffic, let me say like this, is possible. A very interesting question is the distance. As already mentioned, uh, the distance is very important for the application. And in this case, with uh, talking about these passive uh, transponders, we talk about near field communication. This is not a near field communication. This has a range in between 1 and 10 kilometers. And it works completely different than these passive texts. Not only that it's active, also the principle is different. This sends active a magnetic wave, which can be <coughs> detected far away. But in this case, it works like a transformer, like, like you use to change voltages from a high level to a low level. You have two coils. which are very near to each other. And this distance here, the maximum distance, let me say D, depends mainly on the frequency we use. So we want to be in a near field. And when we consider the, the, the propagation of, a, of an electromagnetic wave, So this is also displacement S. The electromagnetic wave propagates with a, with a certain wavelength L. And this wavelength depends on the propagation speed C. Anybody knows the propagation speed of electromagnetic waves? Like the light. So it's about, I think, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. So I think it's about 300,000 kilometers per second. Five, three, yeah, could be this. So the propagation of these electromagnetic waves is uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. And this L is obviously C over the frequency F. S. In terms of time, we also, of course, if it depicted as time, we have also a figure like this. This is the duration of one period 
is 1 over the frequency. So let me see whether the units are correct. So usually it's, it's assigned to lambda. I called it L, but I think probably lambda is more common. So C, unit of C is meter per second. F. What's the unit of F? Hertz. That means 1 over second. Okay, should be correct. Let us calculate the um, wavelength of an ultra high frequency uh, transponder. So when we use that one, 135 kilohertz, so we have the propagation speed of light, 3 times 10 at the power of 8 meter per second over 135, 10 at the power of 3 kilohertz. leads to 3, 5, 30,000 divided by 135, help me. Uh... No, 300,000 divided by 135 is 2,200 meter. 2,200 meter is the wavelength. So <coughs> for this is a low frequency transponder. For low frequency, the wavelength is quite high, in the range of kilometers. So to be near means we have to be nearer than 100 meter. That means the range of low frequency is in principle higher than the range of high frequencies. And when we compare with lambda of U, HF, that means frequency some hundred megahertz, three times 10 at the power of eight meter per seconds over, let me say, 500, or this one has, let us check this one, I think it's, has 800 megahertz, 865 power of 6 hertz. That means 2, 300 over 865. So this is half a meter, less than half a meter. So to be near means within less than half a meter, 40 centimeters or something like that. So just to give you a, a brief idea between the, the context between the wavelength, respectively the frequency and the range of a passive, of a passive tag. So because the passive tag acts like a transformer more than uh, a radio. And for this we have in between in near field, that means we have much more or less than the wavelength of the signal.
Okay, so in this area, we use a, a certain form, a particular form of RFID. It's called NFC, Near Field Communication. So it's an RFID with very short ranges with the advantage of high data security. So RFID, for sure, the, there are some problems with data security. As larger the distance, as more problems you, you become, uh, you get with, with data security. And so in a particular range, we, we talk about NFC, near field communication, um, high frequencies, and for this, uh, low ranges and for high uh, data security. Um, to, to give a, just an idea about the complexity of the data transfer and about coding, we already talked about the barcodes and how data will be coded and um, what, how data can be uh, transformed. i just give you an, a brief overview how radio frequency uh, transmitting systems do it. Uh, this is my example. So it's a radio modem. And the problem is um, the architecture of data transmission that we have different layers. So we have the data just for the application. These can be the temperature, the pressure. And then we have to transform these data to, to realize the transport. So we have to change them, we have to convert them into a binary system, into zero and one and things like that on a particular level. The level is defined due to my uh, transmission, certain voltage level, a certain signal level, things like that. And then we have to add additional information. Where do I have to send my data? Where do they come from? I have to send my identification from the receiver, um, from, uh, from the sink where it, where it goes to. Um, we have to add certain information uh, about the task to do and so on. So we don't have to, it's, it's quite complex. Not only the data is interesting, a lot of different other things are interesting. To send them at least into the network layer. And I prepared um, an application of a simple cyber physical systems realized by these uh, radio modems. The idea is a computer network and the radio modem and on the other side the physical system where we can measure some data like the pressure and the temperature and where we can activate some switches. For example, uh, the heater on or ventilator on or the pump on or something like this. A simple physical system. And how does the communication in between these modems work? It's not that easy. Uh, so first, we have to signify the start of the protocol. We, when we send our data, we have to indicate when our signal starts. So we have to send a particular signal, uh, the start uh, character. Then we have to send the receiver address. Where should this information go to? Then we have to send our ID, the sender address. Where does this information come from? Then we have to send some, in this case, some extensions 
So it's information about, uh, about the system over there, which kind of sensors are, are connected and things like that. Then we have uh, to send information about the length of the information we want to send. Then one part is the message itself. The message itself is um, the command. What should the receiver do with our message? The message is also the, the message what we understand on the message, the, the condition of the pressure of the temperature, the condition of the switches, and that. And at the end, this is the message, at the end we have to do some security task, we have to send a checksum whether this message could be correct or not. And then at the end we have to send again a sign which shines the end of the protocol. So communication is not only to send the message, it's a lot of more information. You have to add a lot of information to make sure that the message uh, reaches its target. Okay, welcome again. Finish with talking about industry. 4.0, what means industry 4.0? Where does it come from? This term, this expression. Anybody knows what is, if there is industry 4.0, what is industry 1.0? Steam machine, yes, that's it, that's it. That's it. The steam machine is industry 1.0. So the idea behind this, obviously now we have industry. Where are we actually? Industry 3.1. <laughs> okay, what is point 0.1? Okay, in between. But the most important development the change from 3 to 4 is obviously in the future. If you say, actually, uh, we are 3.1. But completely correct. So the idea is, at the beginning of industrialization, so um, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, we started, 300 years ago, we started with the steam machine, with the mechanization of the industrial process. We use power plants, we use the water wheel, we use the steel machine, we use mass production, and this is called the industrial revolution, and this is meant to be industry 1.0. For sure, 300 years ago, nobody said that this is industry 1.0. Zero. So it's few back words. And the idea is to underline the importance of this revolution and to underline uh, that it's very accurate and very modern. We use the numbering of software versions like 1.0, 2.0, again and again. And to underline that it's a very significant change, we say, now we are industry 3 point something, and what comes is very, very important. The next version is industry 4.0, 4.0. A very important change. Should uh, suggest whether it will be, we will see. But it could be. There is a possibility that it could be. And I try to explain in the following 10, 15 minutes why. Obviously, mankind is very interested in revolutions. If you take today's newspaper on the first page, what can you see? Österreicher forschen an Internetrevolution. 
So this could be industry 5.0, I think, or something like that. So we are very interested in revolutions. Everything what is very important is a revolution. So also this could be a revolution, and a revolution normally consequences a very important change. Also, not only on the technical point of view, but also in the lifestyle of mankind. So what was the first, or what was the first, most probably the most important revolution of the human being, the so-called Neolithic Revolution. What is the Neolithic Revolution? When the lifestyle from hunting and gathering changed into agriculture and settlement. In the first few, it's just a change how food are produced. Like Industry 4.0. It's just a thing how something is produced. Hunting and gathering. You travel around and hunt and gather what you find to produce food. And then, about 12,000 years ago, in the Middle East, some people had the idea to give up hunting and gathering to settle down and to do agriculture to produce food. And this had a lot of consequences, not only different foods. The consequences were that suddenly we get at densely populated settlements. Hunting and gathering means a group, usually a family, of 20 people are together. Settlement and agriculture actually mean that 20 million people live within one town, within settlement, or a society of India with about 1.3 billion people. Very important change in the, in the lifestyle. Also, political structures. Also, the term of property and ownership is connected with the revolution, with the Neolithic revolution, from producing food, like hunting and gathering, to agriculture. And this is also the idea of companies like Google and Facebook to start a new revolution, perhaps to change again our lifestyle and to think whether the actual political structures like national nations or also perhaps uh, hierarchical ad ideologies or also perhaps property ownership in future is a good system. So the change from one production style to another in history also caused the change in lifestyle very dramatically. The Neolithic Revolution did it very dramatically. And perhaps Industry 4.0, the way how we produce our products should also, or the idea is, when we call it revolution, that it will have consequences in our lifestyle, perhaps also in things like political structures, perhaps we give up nations, we give up borders, we change society, also the idea of property ownership, perhaps in a virtual world or in cyber world, ownership is not any more important, I don't know. But this is the idea behind all this. Um, yeah. So, another um, 
very important revolutions and also where the name is, is arising from is, as we already talked about, is the Industrial Revolution out of the Middle Age where culture had been given up more or less and uh, then in the Industrial Revolution where again um, uh, the lifestyle of mankind changed dramatically. As already mentioned, industry 1.0 is what? It's the steam engine. What is 2.0? Electrical engineering, the introduction of electrical engineering within production. And what is 3.0? Uh, no. Yeah, the, uh, information systems, uh, introduction of computers, uh, not really uh, internet in this case, because we're talking about production process, we're talking about production. So, um, the introduction of IT, and the idea is for 4.0, 4.0, the connection between the cyberspace and the real world, connection between physical systems and the computer world, cyber physical systems, and in the, in the German term, it's called Industry 4.0. Where does it come from, Industry 4.0? It's a, a term out of the German government. So, German government searches for future fields which could be a good market and where they try to do education and research and one strategy is to focus energy on these cyber physical systems and as so many countries does this but as Germany is world champion in production so the German government focused the cyber physical systems in the area of production processes and then they call it industry 4.0 and the idea is I hope now you have an idea about industry 4.0 to have intelligent products that find their own way through the production chain and perhaps this kind of production will change our life. Style. We will see. Thank you very much.